So here we have a caterpillar hiding on this yellow cartridge pea flower. There's a caterpillar right there. A little bit more obvious right now. And it's very clear that you will not have that caterpillar very long if it's not on a yellow flower. So it needs, even that's the flower team, but it needs that very uh, tightly cobalt relationship to exist. And even animals we don't think of as having uh, specialized relationships with plants actually do. And I'm going to use the, the uh, Carolina chickadee as an example. I know we all think of chickadees as seed eaters, and that's because they're eating our, our seed from our feeders all winter long. So they are seed eaters, but when they go to reproduce, when they're making babies, they become specialists on caterpillars. Caterpillar specialists. And it's not because that's the only thing that they can, they can eat. They could have early season grasshoppers or early season crickets or mayflies or serpent flies or snake flies or cereal leaf hoppers or click beetles or cat flies or sow bugs <laughs> or spiders, which I seem to have loved to have there. So all these things are available, but they still only take caterpillars. They become caterpillar specialists. Uh, and all these, if you're, if you're living in a place that doesn't have enough caterpillars, uh, you're not going to have breeding chickens. Almost enough caterpillars is not good enough. They need a certain amount. So that's the next question. How many caterpillars does it take? To make <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot. <laughs>
But again, as other arthropods typically are spiders, and spiders, you needed insects to make the spiders to begin with. So, so this is news to a lot of people. It's news to a lot of people who write books about landscaping for birds because they will tell you how to put plants that make seeds and berries in your landscape. And that's important for some of the birds, typically the birds that don't migrate. But when even those birds are reproducing, they're not eating seeds and berries, they're eating insects. So we need to put the plants that make the insects in our landscapes. Otherwise, we won't have any, any baby birds. So what types of landscapes are capable of producing the, the abundance and diversity of insects that we need to keep these food webs around? And to answer that question, we have to consider uh, the largest group of specialized relationships that we have on the planet. And that's the relationship between insects that, that eat plants and the plants themselves. We have to remember that plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they have loaded their tissues, all of their tissues, with nasty tasting chemicals that, that make, their, uh, make those tissues either bitter or downright toxic. And it's, it's a wonderful effect. It works really well. It keeps most of the insects in the world from eating most of the plants. And that's why when we go outside and we look outside, it's green. It's not because there's nothing out there that wants to eat our plants. It's because most of those plants are so well defended, most of the insects cannot eat them. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? Well, they specialize. What they have to do is develop specialized adaptations to allow them to circumvent the chemical defenses of plants. They have to get around those defenses. So first they, they modify their, their physiology, they, they develop the specialized <coughs> enzymes and physiological mechanisms that allow them to break down those toxins and excrete and store them. They, they have specialized behavioral adaptations. If you've ever watched a monarch eat a, a, a milkweed, it has to block the flow of the sticky latex set before it can eat it. Very interesting behaviors to do that. And we also have specialized life history adaptations. Many of the insects that eat plants only eat them at a certain time when the defenses are at a stage where those insects can handle them. It takes a long time for all of those adaptations to fall into place. It doesn't happen overnight. Let me give you uh, an example here. I could pick any plant out there and give, give you an example. Not, but I'm choosing eastern red cedar at this point, and this is true for, for all the red cedars. Red cedars defend themselves with a toxic monoterpene called beta-thuia plexin. And it is a very successful defense. Cedars have been in our landscapes for millions of years, interacting with our local insects for millions of years. And yet there's still very few insects that have been able to get around beta-thuia plexin. One that has, though, is the juniper hair street. It's a specialist on cedars. It's developed the adaptations that allow it to eat beta thuia plexin without dying. And that's the upside of specialization. So now this beautiful butterfly can eat a plant that is toxic to almost everything else. The downside of specialization is that now that's all it can eat. So by specializing in eastern red cedar, it, uh, it has not developed the adaptations that allow it to eat anything else. It can't eat oats, it can't eat grasses, it can't eat lilacs, and, and so on. Which means if we don't have eastern red cedars in our landscapes, or any kind of red cedar in our landscape, we're not going to have the juniper hair street. That's the take home message of specialization. Now, if you're going to specialize on, uh, on red cedar, you might as well look like it. Is there any caterpillar here? There it is. There it is. Is this sad? Yeah. I showed this picture to my wife and I said, you see the caterpillar? And she said, of course. And I said, yeah, that's pretty easy to see. And she said, well, I didn't see that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I hadn't seen it when I took the picture. <laughs> there are two in this picture. We've got a big one right here. And the one. You, can even, you can even look like the dead parts. Uh, uh, this is the juniper geometer right there. Of course, looking like dead, dead people. Uh, so fun with crisis. But specialization in today's world has become a curse because of the way we humans have treated the landscape. 
we are taking away the plants on which our local insects have specialized. And nothing illustrates this better than the monarch butterfly. And you all know the monarch's in trouble. Uh, last year, overwintering in, in Mexico, there were only 3.6% of the monarchs there compared to 1976. So we've lost uh, 96.7, I can't do the math. We've lost a lot of, of the monarchs. Why? Um, you'll hear a lot of reasons why, but this is the main one. We've adopted clean farming techniques. Roundup ready corn and soybean over tens of thousands, tens of thousands of square miles of the Midwest, and now it's all moving east, by the way. Uh, which means we don't have what we call weeds in agriculture anymore. Now I get that we don't have weeds in, in the, the fields themselves, but having some, some uh, flowering plants out there uh, is not going to reduce yield at, at all. Yeah, that's what we don't have. It's, you know, right up to the road, you either have the, the plant itself uh, or, or bare ground. Uh, and that, of course, is taking away the milkweeds. That's what the monarchs are, are uh, breeding on. It also is taking away the fall asters and all the flowering plants that the monarch needs as it's moving south. Everybody says you've got to plant milkweeds for monarchs, and you do, but you also have to plant all the forage the monarchs need as they're migrating south. Uh, and, of course, you, you Texans have a really important problem because all the monarchs fall right, right through this part of Texas. Uh, so this is uh, what a monarch looks like after she has spent the winter in, in Mexico and has flown back. This is a female. I was standing on the banks of the Rio Grande in April. She was crossing the Rio Grande, and she was the, the basis of this year's population. She looks pretty bad, but she made it. I mean, she'd already flown about 800 miles north and was continuing now, in June, was it June, early June? Maybe it was late May. I think it was early June. I was looking at this, this Asclepius tuberosa, uh, this butterfly weed. We gotta get rid of the word weed. And weed tells everybody to kill the plant no matter what. And all native plants are named weeds. Jokai weed, but we've got Alanthus is the tree of heaven. <laughs> Let's change our language. These are not these are, this is the basic of the basis of the food web. Yeah, we're looking at, at the Sclepius tuberosa, and uh, there, there was a monarch. Now, about last year, I saw one monarch all season long. So this was June, and I saw a monarch, and I was happy. I tied last year's record. And then I, I, I looked for another five minutes, two more monarchs. I saw three monarchs circling around to that plant in just a few minutes. So that was it. You know, I had three times more monarchs than I'd seen all last year. I was very excited. Uh, you know where I was? I was on the High Line in New York City. <laughs> I was in the middle of Manhattan. The High Line is an elevated rail bed that uh, was abandoned for decades. And then somebody went up and looked and saw a bunch of native plants. And they said, why don't we make this a nature destination for New Yorkers? It's been enormously popular. It's you know, people up there all the time. And this is what we got. A little two or three foot stretch of, of habitat, but that was enough to have monarchs. It was enough to have, have um, leaf cutter bees and several other things, which tells me, I mean, I heard of the, the, the High Line, the Ad Nauseam forever. I gotta go see the High Line, and I figured, yeah, I'll see the High Line, but nothing will be there. I was wrong. <laughs> Things will find these plants, no matter where we put them, but we have to put them. So it's, uh, uh, it's actually looking a little bit better for the monarch this year, and we'll talk about, about that in a few more minutes. <clears throat> Talking about specialization, it's not just caterpillars that are specialists. This is the elderberry beetle only eats elderberry. The dog bane beetle only eats dog bane. The sumac flea beetle only eats sumac. This is a leaf-footed bug, a Korean bug that only eats ash trees. You've heard of the emerald ash borer coming to take out all of our ashes. It is taking out all of our ashes. And, and if it succeeds, this insect will disappear. Dave Wagner, University of Connecticut, just finished a paper looking at all of the insects dependent on ash. It's 95 species that he could find so far. They will disappear if we lose our ashes. And, and that's the problem. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. So if we take away the plants on which they specialize, we're going to lose 90% of the insects that eat plants. But you can use this knowledge of specialization to actually turn things around and rebuild food webs if we understand who's in that food web and what they depend on. So let's do that. Let's uh, use the white eyed vireo. I'm going to use white eyed vireo because that's the nest that my wife had in our yard. 
then again, I'm always setting up the camera and standing behind it, because that's all I do. <laughs> but I want to see what these birds were bringing back to the nest. And if we look at the insects they were bringing back to the nest, we could match it and see what plant was required to make those insects and make sure they're in the landscape. So this is just an example of how we could rebuild a food web. This is the blind insects. It's a specialist on black cherry. So yes, you have black cherry on Wednesday, so these birds got to, got to eat. Uh, this little caterpillar you're going to read right here is the chestnut chisura. It is a specialist on native viburnum. We have viburnum tentatum in our landscape because we planted it. When we moved in 14 years ago, it was mowed for hay. Wasn't anything there. So almost all the plants that are in our, our uh, yard at this point are ones that we put there. This guy is the drab prominent. It's a specialist on second word. By now you're thinking, well, I'm just making up all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but look, it's not that hard. You see the two little enoprolates there? Um, only, only prominence as larvae have those enoprolates sticking up like that. And only the drab prominent has a white stripe down its back. So this is not rocket science. You really can figure out what these things are. Uh, we have sycamore, so yes, we have, we have that caterpillar. This is the eight spotted forester moth. It's a specialist on native grapes. Uh, this is the lunate zelle, another specialist on black cherry. So that black cherry is contributing more than one species to this food web. Here we have the spice of swallowtail, which is a little eye right there. So this is a, a larva that is supposed to scare birds by looking like a tree snake. Didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it's especially on spice bush um, and sassafras, which are closely related uh, plants. And we have both of those. And this guy is the tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on black cherry. So one thing, note, these are all specialists. Uh, I didn't see any generalists coming back when I was out there. Uh, and black cherry is a really important part of this, of this food web. But these guys are very hungry. They need a lot more than that. So let's put some, some black walnut into the landscape, and we can have the walnut space. We can have the gray-edged bonologa. We can have the black blotch caesura. We can have the bride. These are all specialists on uh, black, uh, black walnut where I live. We have native maples. We can have Plagodes inchworms, a green striped maple worm, or the retarded dagger moth. <laughs> if we have native elms, we can have four horned sphinx or the double tooth prominent. If you have witch hazel, you can have the mustard sallow. Violets. What happens to violets? Do you have violets here? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> in, in my neighborhood, when violets come up, the first thing everybody does is mow them down because they typically come up in, in our yard. But uh, of course, violets are the, the only host plants for our true fritillaries, not the goat fritillary. And that's what the larvae look like. And um, they overwinter as well. So when you come up in the spring, the larvae are on your violets already. When you mow them down, you've just wiped out your, all your summer generations of true fritillaries. So let's leave some patches of the violets. So yes, remember that 90% of the insects, the herbivores that are out there, uh, are not going to be out there if you don't have the plants with which they co-evolved over all those, those many, many eons. So if we want uh, the hacker emperor, we need the hacker. If we want the Kukulio asteroides, we need native asteroids. If we want the brown hooded owl, we need, we need goldenrod, the hog sphinx, the pandora sphinx, the abbot sphinx, the uh, Virginia creeper. If you want the river bridge to act along, believe it or not, you need river bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Same with the zebra swallowtail, you need, you need pawpaw. It's a specialist on pawpaw. If you want the red bud leaf roller, you need red bud. If you want the large pectes, you need sweet gum. If you want the gray fertility, you need native willows. If you want the turbulent phosphilla, who would not want the turbulent phosphilla? <laughs> you need green briar. And of course, if you want the orange tufted phonida, or the variable oak leaf caterpillar, or the red helmet bookworm, or the heat striped bookworm, or the elevated dagger moth, or the lesser dagger moth, or the greater dagger moth, or the, the afflicted dagger moth. <laughs> Like the, the street dagger moth, or the white blotched heterocampa, or the oblique heterocampa, or the red line kind of put up, or the laughter, you need oaks. Those are all specialists on oaks. Why do we need all these caterpillars? Well, we only talk about, about the birds needing the caterpillars. Um, but it's not just birds. It's not just birds that are out there. All spiders eat insects. 
or the ego that spiders did in insects. So we, we need to have insects for spiders. And you know, a lot of people don't like spiders. And actually, I don't, I don't want them crawling on me either. When I was little, I had a friend who used to throw them at me. <laughs> <laughs> but we absolutely need spiders. You know who likes spiders? Birds like spiders. The second most uh, important component of bird food webs after the caterpillars. So we certainly can't get rid of our, of our spiders. Insect predators, all the insect predators that are out there that are eating insect herbivores would disappear if we lost our insect herbivores. Our frogs eat insects, our toads eat insects, all the amphibians eat insects. Our lizards eat insects, our bats eat insects. Even our rodents eat insects. Why? Because insects aren't really good food. Pound for pound, there's twice as much protein in insect meat from some studies. Another study shows it's the same amount, but either way, it's a lot of protein compared to beef. And insects have, have abdomen in their, their abdomens. They have organs in their abdomens that are uh, called fat bodies that are loaded with lipids. And lipids are high energy compounds that allow these guys to grow really quickly and reproduce quickly. And if you're a mouse, that's what you want to do. Because there's a lot of things that want to eat you. They're important components of food webs as well. Same reason that large organisms are eating insects. They're just really good food. The skunk is digging up your yard to get the grubs that are in your yard. Possums eat a lot of insects. Raccoons eat a lot of insects. And even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects, like red foxes. 25% of a red fox's diet is insects. 23% of a black bear's diet is insects. I don't care how big they are, they need insects. And even things that don't eat insects need insects. This is a, this is a, uh, <coughs> sharp shin hawk. It's a, it's a bird predator. Although I do have pictures of the sharp shin hawk with dragonflies in its, in its time. But most of the time it's eating birds. So you might think you can have sharp shin hawks in your neighborhood even if you get rid of all the insects which of course your mosquito fogging machines are doing. Uh, but you can't because the birds in this guy is eating needed insects to become birds. Same thing with the garden snake. It's not eating insects directly, but it's eating the frogs and toads that needed the insects to become frogs and toads. You cannot take insects out of your local food webs without those food webs collapsing. So a world without insects is a world without biological diversity. And a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. That's the take-home message here. We cannot allow all these things to disappear, or we ourselves will disappear. Now, some people say, well, I don't think that's true. Let's do the experiment. See if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> the people who study this stuff say that's true, so let's, let's go with that. What is happening to all the things that eat insects, all those insectivores that are out there? Well, I, you know, a few weeks ago, I got a sneak preview of the, the uh, State of the Birds report. It's not a sneak anymore. It's, it's at 230 species of North American birds are headed for extinction. Now, the report, um, the report focused on climate change. It said, because of climate change, we're going to lose these birds. You can take climate change away. Climate change is real, it's terrible, but habitat destruction and the loss of the plants that make the food for these birds is another really important component of the decline of these birds. You know what that species that the bird is? Mm -hmm. Bottom leg, right? Again, most of the audiences I talk to don't know what it is, and I don't blame them because we have lost, already lost 95% of our bottom legs. Nobody sees them anymore. And that's a neotropical migrant. That's what's happening to neotropical migrants all over the place. We now have 50% fewer birds than we had just 40 years ago. Birds are ecological indicators. If they are declining, there is something wrong with their ecosystems. And those are the same ecosystems that are supporting us. So from a selfish perspective, that's why we need to pay attention to this. But why can't, why can't all of these species, this biodiversity, be sustained in the parks and preserves that we do have? And we keep making more parks and preserves every time I go someplace, we're putting in a new prairie that's super. Why is that not enough? Well, it's not enough because these places aren't big enough, at least on an individual basis. When you take a large habitat like this and you shrink it down to a small habitat like this, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small or tiny populations. And that's the problem. Tiny populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up, and in bad times, they go down. 
If you're a large population, even in your death cycle, there's enough individuals to get the increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, you often blink out. You, you, you hit zero in your little habitat patch. Uh, and then you're gone. That's called local extinction. And unless you recolonize, and so many things cannot recolonize because our habitats are fragmented, there's too many roads and things in between them, that they're permanently gone. So that is true local extinction. And this is the real problem with the monarch right now. If you have a tiny population of monarchs compared to what they need to sustain their numbers, then you get weather events, you get the drought in Texas, you get the cold spring, you get all these things you hear people saying have knocked the monarch down. They're very high part on tiny populations, but they're normal in the long run. When you have millions of monarchs, they can handle it. So we've got to get the monarch populations up high enough again so they can handle these normal up and downs that every population faces. And there's studies all over the world that are, are uh, looking at the ability of our, our parks and preserves to sustain nature. And they're all saying the same thing. These things are not big enough to sustain the nature that we need them to sustain. And by sustain, I mean four hour run up to five years. I'm talking about four hour. And that, unfortunately, uh, includes our largest national parks. Now we can actually measure what is happening when we allow species, plant species from someplace else, from outside of our local food webs, and that's how I, I define a non-native, to displace the native plant communities. We can measure what happens to food webs. So let's do that. We've done this a number of times. I'm just going to share one data set with you because they're all saying the same thing. This is a hedgerow in, in Maryland. Um, and we looked at hedgerows in Maryland, and Pennsylvania, and, and Delaware. They pretty much all look like this. It's invading. This is autumn olive, genus Ugly Agnes. We call it Ugly Agnes now because it's, it's, a, uh, it's a serious invasive species. You know, one of these that we brought over is an ornamental. It's not the only thing in that, that hedgerow. We've got multiflora rose, and varietal bittersweet, and Japanese honeysuckle, and porcelain berry, and, and privet, and nori maple, and lanthus, and miscanthus, and barberry, you name it, it's there. All of them are escapees from our garden. And many of those plants were still selling in our nurseries. So this is what hedgerows look like. And what we did was measure caterpillars in those hedgerows in a standardized way and compare them with hedgerows that are not invaded. We could still find a few. Uh, and this is what we got. Five times more species of caterpillars in the uninvaded hedgerows. And 22 times more caterpillars themselves. So when a, when a bird is looking for a caterpillar, it's, I don't know, maybe it cares what species it is, but, but typically we're just counting, counting uh, numbers here, and we think that that's important. So what we have here is the message that these plants, and they're almost all from Asia, but they are out of town. Non-native plants are very poor at making caterpillars. Now, does that matter? Well, again, yeah, it matters if you eat caterpillars. And that's what our birds are doing when they're breeding. This is the common um, yellow crib. This male is trying to feed his babies with a nest on the ground here. If he's in a habitat that is overrun with ugly eggs, he's going to have to forage 22 times harder to get the same amount of food that he was getting before. And some people have suggested that he do that. Just work 22 times harder and everything will be okay. But of course he can't do that. He's already foraging all day long. 156 trips a day, one trip every five minutes. Can't be that 22 times harder. So the prediction is, and we're measuring this now, uh, that you will have 22 times less bird biomass in an area where you've taken away what they're eating. Now, how different can plants actually be at supporting food webs? Uh, well, many of you know that we have we have uh, created a big list. We have ranked all the plants in, in the uh, mid Atlantic states, all the plant genera, in terms of their ability to make caterpillars. That's our, our uh, surrogate for making uh, all insects. So we rank them from the best to, to the worst. And a lot of people say, I want to see this list so I can use it in my state. Well, it's not going to be relevant in Texas. It's not going to be relevant in place else. So the Forest Service is funding us to make a list for every state. Uh, and not only that, they want us to make a list for every county in every state. <laughs> and they want it by Christmas. <laughs> Progress and, and uh, we will have a list of Texas some, sometime. 
But let's just look at a few examples. Um, in the, in the uh, mid-Atlantic states, oaks are number one. 557 species recorded on oaks of, of just caterpillars. So far, that, that number keeps going up. Now let's compare that to a favorite street tree. I see these all, all over the world here. Ginkgo, of course, from China. Four species are recorded on, on ginkgo. One of them is a cecropia moth, recorded on ginkgo. Uh, and what I suspect happens here, a lot of these species will crawl off their real host plant and they'll just go to some other place and, and form their cocoon. So these are records in the literature. I don't think it's a croquet moth was ever eating ginkgo. And I'll give you $10,000 if you find one eating ginkgo. <laughs> this is what ginkgo looks like. It's never, there's never a, a single bite taken out of it. But anyway, even if those four are legitimate, that's 557 versus, versus four. Number two on the list is uh, our, our native prunus, our, our, all of our cherries, our black cherries, our, our pin cherries, our, American plum, Chickasaw plum, these are all native prunus. 456 species of caterpillars on native prunus, compared to Zelkova, very common street tree now, because it looks like elm. It's also from China, zero caterpillars on Zelkova. Nothing's been recorded on Zelkova. How about a favorite foundation plant, the Aristoponica? Two species recorded on that. What if we use the native viburnum? 103 species recorded on so there are huge differences between favorite ornamentals and the native plants that could replace them in our landscapes. And we are not fooling the birds when we put these non-natives in. I have a, I have a student, uh, Desiree Naranjo, who's doing a super job in, in the suburbs of, of DC. Uh, what you're looking at here is a home range of a pair of, of green chickadees, and she's got 90 such pairs. The star is where the nest was, and what she has done is record all the places that the parents have foraged when they're getting food for their, their babies. So the blue, I mean, the, the dark blue is, is where they spend 50% of their time, the light blue is where they spend 95% of their time foraging. So that's where they're foraging. Those are the plants they're foraging on. Native plants, basswood, uh, you know, American elm, black cherry, oaks, oaks, oaks. Let's compare that with the plants that they're not going to at all. So those are other plants there. They're not within those ranges. We've got our ginkgos and our crape myrtles and our lilac cypress and our, our saucer magnolias, silk tree, Japanese maples. So, you know, the birds actually do go there. They go and they hunt in those trees for five minutes. They say, nothing here. So that's it. It's called optimal foraging. They will not waste their time in an area where there is no food. And then they go to the areas where there is food. And you can easily imagine neighborhoods where that's all we have are these trees producing not enough food. And when we make neighborhoods like that, we have eliminated the ability for these types of birds to, to reproduce. And that's what we're doing. We are moving plants all over the world, uh, creating what ecologists now call novel ecosystems. This is Richard Hobbs from Australia, and he has estimated that 75% of the ecosystems on this planet are novel. And that means they are comprised of organisms that have no evolutionary history together. They've come together for the first time. That's what Richard Hobbs says. This is what I say. When they come together for the first time, they have not had the time to develop all those specialized relationships that I talked about earlier in the talk. The specialized relationships that are nature. So we've got not only ecosystems, but we can't call them nature. Not yet. Will they ever become nature? Will they ever develop those relationships? Well, you know, yeah, 10,000, 100,000 years from now, who knows? But what happens in, in the meantime? So why does it matter? It matters because we're creating ecosystems with, that have just a whole bunch of species because they can't, because the food webs that support those species are not there. They're not supported by such ecosystems. And that means we have, we're suffering a loss of biodiversity. So this matters to us because it's biodiversity that runs the ecosystems, that makes the ecosystem services, that keeps humans around. There are, there are you know, there's too many steps there to convince any politician that this is important. But uh, believe me, biodiversity <laughs> equals human survival. There was a, a huge study in 2005, millennial ecosystem assessment, hundreds of scientists from around the world and their main goal was to determine um, what the state of the planet was in terms of its ability to make ecosystem services. And they decided we have already degraded 60% of the planet's ability to make ecosystem services. Not good news. That's the ocean, by the way. Not good news. Uh, 
because, of course, every time we add a person to the planet, we need more ecosystem services to support that person along with everything else. And we're doing that three times a second, uh, once every three seconds. Every four and a half days, we get another million people. Uh, but right now, every time we add somebody to the planet, we get fewer ecosystem services. That's a relationship we must turn around. We must turn that around. Why don't we let our natural areas make all the ecosystem services we, we need? We've kind of already answered that. Uh, we don't have enough natural areas left. This is the light map of the U.S. taken from the space shuttle. Uh, and it shows where we are. We're everywhere. Some of the darkest areas out here, of course, are the, the drier areas of the west. All of those spaces have cattle on them. I just read an article by Elizabeth Colbert in the National Geographic about our wilderness areas. Uh, and, and it's a great article, and it's talking about how 5% how, um, you know, of the U.S. is in what's designated as wilderness. What she doesn't say is that on almost all of those lands, we have cattle, because you were allowed to graze cattle in wilderness areas. Well, anyway, we're everywhere. Not enough nature out there to make the ecosystem services that we need. So we have to take all of the land. We have to take the land that we can easily manipulate we have usurped from, from nature. And I'm talking about where we live and where we work. We, we made it look like that. We now have to turn it around so that it can actually produce the ecosystem services that we desperately need. There is a family that lives in this house, and if they're not making all the ecosystem services they need on their property, they're going to have to borrow them from someplace else. Now, they used to borrow them from nature, not of nature anymore. They're not going to borrow them from their neighbor, because he's not making any either. They're not going to borrow them from their, their, uh, their township's open space, because typically open space, at least in the east, is a golf course, or it's a soccer field, or it's simply a big lawn with a paved circle around it, and people walk in circles around <laughs> So, how are we going to make ecosystem services at home here? What do we need to do to this? Now, they have achieved the, the uh, perfect lawn, but let's say they want to make clean water. Well, lawn doesn't make clean water. Lawn makes dirty water. Uh, and we have measured how much lawn we have in, in the suburbs of, of uh, Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. 92%, this, this is what it looks like, 92% of the landscaped area is lawn. So we're not making clean water there. If you want to sequester carbon, and we do want to sequester carbon, Right now, we only have 10% of the trees in our suburban landscapes that we could have, uh, and the short-lived ornamental trees. So things like red repair that grow for 30 years and then fall over in the first ice storm and release all the carbon they have just sequestered. We need the long-lived guys. We need, we need the trees like your, your live oaks here that are doing a wonderful job of sequestering carbon. And of course, we need more than just 10% of the tree biomass. And if we want to rebuild food webs, in our yards. We can't be using trees or, or plants from, from Asia because they were more at doing that. This is my neighbor's house. You've heard about my neighbor's house before, I think. Um, he has 10 acres. Most of it's lawn. You can't see it from here. And every plant that he has in his yard is an out of town. It's a non-native plant um, to our area. So the question is, how have we gotten here? We have gotten here because we have come to see plants just as decorations. In the last hundred years, we have scoured the world for the prettiest plants because if they're only decorations, we might, have, might as well use the prettiest ones and decorate our landscape. So, decorative value is, is important. Maybe it can be a screen and anchor and a focal point, but it's all about aesthetics. We painted our landscape with these, uh, with these beautiful plants. But we haven't spent any time thinking about the ecological roles that these plants perform. We can do that. We can balance this seesaw by including very important ecological roles that our landscape plants need to start to do. Food web value, I rank very high because if you don't have any food web value in your plant, you don't have anything else in your yard. So you're not going to have any ecosystem function, you won't have any food value. But all these other things turn out to be important as well. Can we find beautiful plants that also are functional? Yes, we can. It just has to be a new, new goal. So I would say a biodiversity friendly sort of well, one more thing. We need we need to, to raise the bar of what we have asked our landscapes to do. In the past, we have only asked them to be beautiful. They're good at that. But now we have to ask them to be beautiful and functional at the same time. They're up to it. They can do it. 
What does a biodiversity-friendly suburb look like? Uh, no one answers to this. This is the most important thing we need to do. We need to create uh, biological corridors, living viable uh, 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 habitats in between those isolated habitat fragments. So we need to connect those isolated habitat fragments with the viable landscapes so that those habitat fragments that remain are not isolated anymore. If they're not isolated anymore and if they're connected, they're not tiny anymore. And if they're not tiny anymore, the populations within them won't be tiny anymore. So when they fluctuate, they will not disappear anymore. This is the single most important thing we need to do to stop the species drain from our local ecosystem. And that's where ecosystems function. They don't function globally. A lot of people don't worry about a species. If there's still a few in the Smokies, they say, it's okay, we don't have to worry about it. But if they're gone from our local ecosystem, we have compromised ecosystem function. Where are we gonna put these biological partners? I suggest we put them in the area that's now in We have 45.6 million acres of lawn. We're adding 500 square miles of lawn to the U.S. every year. Why? Because lawn is a status symbol. You know, I'm a human, I get it that we need status symbols. It's just part of our psyche, we're not going to give them up. But I was in, I was in, uh, I was in Montana or Wyoming, someplace out there, and they didn't have big lawns. Now, they only get nine inches of rain, so that was one reason. But I asked them, I said, well, you know, where are your big lawns? They said, that's not our status symbol. I said, oh, what is your status symbol? They said, big belt bottoms. <laughs> so I said, that's great. If we double the size of our belt bottoms and, and cut the size of our one in half. <laughs> of course, we want to build those, we want to build those, those uh, cars out of the plants that are going to maintain, they're going to sustain the food waste we're trying to create. This is what we used to do. We used to build our house, we put in a foundation planting right next to it, plant a few trees, then we're exhausted, no more landscaping, so everything by default became lawn. Let's turn that on its head. Let's build a house and now figure out where we do want a lawn. We're not going to eliminate one because it is the perfect plant to walk on uh, without, without killing it. So figure out where you want to walk and move around your landscape. Where can lawn actually direct you to, to the interesting things that are happening at home? I look at where my neighbors walk on their 10 acres of, of grass. Nowhere. They're never outside. <laughs> If you convince your neighbors to do the same thing, you've got that connectivity that I'm talking about. It connects with the woodlot over here and the woodlot over there, or the prairie on either end. It doesn't matter which biome you're talking about. And you just stop the species drain from your local ecosystems. We still have lawn. We still get to play with our, our lawnmowers. But <laughs> if we do this in half of the area that is now in lawn, let's make the math simple and say it's 40 million acres. We can create a new national park that will be 20 million acres in size. We're going to do it at home. Uh, so we will call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Tetons, plus Canyonlands, Mountain Rivier, North Cascade, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus the Nile, which is huge, plus the Great Southern Mountain. And all those parks, it's still less than 20 million acres. So we're going to make the biggest national park. We also have the big thicket. Yeah. Take yeah. <laughs> <laughs> areas that, that look like this and turn them into this. This, another, another house down the street from me. Put some trees on it. Make it an interesting place. Or you can, you can go a whole lot. Make it look like that. And here we have a, a, a mulch structure. <laughs> <laughs> This obviously is an attempt at a foreign landscape because you can't use native plants formally. This is in the middle of Indianapolis. It's all native plants. This is the first year of the planting. It's a formal landscape. You can use native plants formally. And when that grows into more, it'll be even more productive. This is a landscape, an industrial landscape, that, uh, or a corporate landscape that invites the employees out at, at noon to get sunburned. <laughs> it could be a lovely landscape like this. And we heard this morning that there's a lot of research about the benefits, the medical benefits of spending just 15 minutes in a landscape like this. And you know, some of them are obvious, your blood pressure drops, the stress hormone 
in, in your blood, your cortisol uh, drops, these are easy to measure. Uh, your cancer is cured, you don't get divorced anymore. All kinds of <laughs> I'm only half king because, because uh, they have shown your immune system is boosted. The benefits you get from spending time in landscapes like this are very similar to the benefits you get from intense meditation. So if your immune system is boosted, maybe you don't get cancer. Another really important thing, the most recent research is showing that we are bombarded with information and, and stimulus overload all the time, all day long. That's not news to you guys. So to tune this out, it takes energy. If you're going to process it, it takes energy. Either way, you end up at the end of the day exhausted because of all this stuff happening to us. And that takes a real toll on your attention span, which means in school you do a poor job. It means you can't attend to your, your spouse. You're just, you know, you were burned now. You need to recharge your attention span every day. The best way to do that, research is showing, is to spend time in, in nature. It doesn't take a lot of time, but you need that little sacred place that you can go to every day and, and recharge. The television doesn't work. It doesn't recharge you. So where do you have to have these, these opportunities to recharge? It's got to be where you live. That's the only place you're going to be every single day. So I am going to add another circle up here called human health. It's becoming more and more obvious that this is critical. It's critical to our well-being. And when you create a landscape like this, you add, you add several things to your life. You have surprise, anticipation, and entertainment. And by surprise, I mean you can't walk into a landscape like this without seeing something you didn't expect to see. Maybe you will see the spun glass slope. Um, you know, right, this is my favorite caterpillar. But you know, right there in, in your yard. Um, or maybe you'll see the birds in April. Beautiful, beautiful moth. Just Maybe you'll see a dead leaf right here that actually turns out to be a caterpillar. This is the showy emerald. I think that's neat. Or maybe you'll see the fawn space. You know, here all the time, I go, to, I go to talks and people show slide for slide of plants and they say, this will knock your socks off. This will knock your socks off. That knocks my socks off. <laughs> I was outside my bathroom window hanging in my ashtray. I think it's a beautiful creature. And it's part of the beauty that comes to your landscape when you put functional plants in them. Or maybe you can see some interesting behavior. This is the red spot. Purple, it's a female. She wants to lay an egg, so she lands on a black cherry leaf. She only lays her eggs at the very tip of the leaf. So she inches her way down to the bottom of the leaf, tips her out and then touches that leaf, and leaves a beautiful little leaf here. And she will do it right in front of you if you're just standing still. Or maybe you can see one of the fantastic spinjic ample moths. You guys have this here. My, and it's interesting, if I show this picture to an adult, the first thing they say is, it's going to sting me. When I show it to my, my granddaughter, she says, is it tickly? <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to sting you, and it is tickly. <laughs> Anticipation. Throw your calendar. You can anticipate the changes of, of the, the seasons by what happens in your yard. At our house, spring doesn't come until the woodcock kind of comes. And we get to anticipate it. <laughs> Talking about you know, essays, you heard the woodcock today, you've seen the woodcock. Finally, we hear it and see it. And that renews us, that gives us hope. It shows nature is still working. In spite of all the bad news we, we have, these things still happen on time. We know that it's midsummer when the white line space uh, pollinates our, our uh, evening primrose, and we know it's fall when the jungle comes. You can set your own calendar with what happens around you. Entertainment, you know, Bob was Buckeye in your yard. Two summers ago, I walked by and 17 swallowtails flew up. You can't walk through the class 17 swallowtails without a smile on your face. You just can't do it. But does this mean 100% of your, your uh, plants have to be native? No, it really does. There is room for compromise here. I just want you to understand what each plant in your yard is doing and what it's not doing, what its real function is. Uh, I, I like to use crepe myrtle as an example, because we've got a lot of crepe myrtles. In Carolina, it's the only plant left. <laughs> 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 because it's, it's a beautiful plant. It's got lovely bark, nice habit, beautiful blooms. Uh, what's it contributing to local food webs? Nothing. Nothing. So what is a plant that is beautiful, but not contributing anything? I think it's like a statue. It's a beautiful object in your So the question is, how many statues? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
bugs, uh, they're actually beetles, and uh, both as adults and as larvae, but particularly as larvae, they are predators. They live in leaf litter. If we eliminate our leaf litter and we use chemicals, we don't have any lightning bugs. So if you have lightning bugs coming back to your yard, you're doing something right. You've created a ground habitat that is moist enough and, and has enough of these guys to eat to sustain lightning bugs. Another way to measure success is to have something eaten out of the leaves in your area. You know, people used to grab the spray can and, uh-oh, what's going to happen to my tree? But this is a sign that that tree has passed on some of the energy that it's harnessed and, and we actually have a functioning food there. And of course, if you have breeding birds on your property, um, feeding their babies all those insects, that's a great sign of success because it takes a lot of insects. So why do we want native plants in our garden? These are all uh, reasons that have been suggested. Some of them aim directly at me. The first one uh, is that we want them so we can have a sense of place. Uh, well, that's great. If we care about a sense of place. You know, sense of place is, to, is, is, is understanding what biome you're in, understanding the plants that should be. So when you see them, you, you have a sense of where you are in, in, this, in this great land of ours. Uh, and you appreciate that. And if you have botanical knowledge, some people will appreciate that, but you know, you can drive across the country and go into any neighborhood and look at the landscapes, and they are all identical. They're all using the same few species of Chinese plants. So people don't care about a sense of place. I don't think that's ever going to convince anybody. We're not using native plants because they're prettier than non-native plants. We got beautiful native plants, but we got beautiful and it's not a fair comparison. We really have scoured the world looking for the prettiest non-natives, and we've done a great job at doing that. So we're not going to win that argument. Either. Now these three have been applied to me, uh, that, that uh, I like native plants because I'm nostalgic for the past. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't like the past. That's not the reason. It's, and it's not because I oppose change. I hear all the time that ecosystem change is normal. I shouldn't fight it. Ecosystem change is normal. But the rate at which we are changing our ecosystems is not normal. We have never changed our ecosystems. Our ecosystems have not changed as fast as humans are changing them right now um, since the asteroid hit 66 million years ago. Um, that was not a happy time. I don't want to repeat that. <laughs> and it's also not because I just like farmers. That's called nativism. That's, that's nonsense. I like native plants because I like ecosystem function. It's something you all need, whether you like nature or not. You absolutely need ecosystem function. It is not debatable. And you're only going to get ecosystem function with the co-op relationships of the animals that live in those, those ecosystems. The model ecosystems are not going to deliver it. So we, we, can, uh, we really can't save nature if we embrace those specialized relationships that are nature. If we ignore them, it's not going to work. And I want to end with, with um, an example of how easily it can work. This is the Atala butterfly. And it turns out that it was accidentally saved from extinction in southern Florida. This is how that happened. It's a, it's a Lycaenid butterfly. It's beautiful as an adult. It's beautiful as a larva. It is beautiful as a chrysalis. And like the other species I talked about today, it's a host plant specialist. And in this case, an extreme specialist. It only eats one species of plant. The Kunti, this is a native cycad that also uh, lives in southern Florida. And Kunti has a lot of starch in its roots. So the Seminole Indians discovered that and used it as a source of starch for their food. They taught the, the uh, settlers who came to Florida to use Kunti as well. And the settlers decided they would make a starch industry out of Kunti. In the 2012 or the uh, 1912 census, you have to break down what your occupation is, and 80% of the people living in Miami put down starch gatherer as their, as their profession. So you guessed it, they gathered all the starch. Kunti was eliminated from the wild. There were a few plants in the gardens, but it was essentially gone. So if you take away the host plant of the Itala butterfly, you take away the Itala butterfly. Nobody could find it. So when we had the Endangered Species Act, there was a desperate attempt to find a talus so we could get it listed as an endangered species, so we could get some uh, conservation money to help save it. But they couldn't find it. And that's one of the rules. You have to have something in order to save it. So instead, they got it listed as officially extinct. Well, about that time, the landscaping industry discovered Kunti as a viable landscape plant. 
It's a low-growing evergreen shrub that is well in the sandy soils of, of South Florida. So they started to promote it. Uh, and, and now it's fairly common. It's quite common in, in neighborhoods. You go around and almost everybody has coonty plants. And lo and behold, the Italian butterfly showed up again. Nobody knows where it came from. There had to have been a, a, a population that, that persisted in the Everglades and then came out and started to colonize the residential landscape. Coochie is still going from the wild as far as anybody knows. But now there's enough of it to be supporting these guys um, along the road. So what, what I love about this story is that it truly was an accident. They never got it listed as an endangered species. They never got one dime of conservation money, which is good because we don't have one dime of conservation money. <laughs> Without even trying, but simply by adding one plant species to the palette of what is used in residential landscaping, they were able to save this species from extinction. So think what we could do if we made conservation a goal of residential landscape. We could do amazing things. And I think it's going to work because nature's really malleable. It's, it's forgiving. It's resilient. It will give us one last chance if we act soon. Thanks very much. <laughs>